researchers we have here tonight. Uh, so this is Professor Nina Lord, a human geographer with interests in global challenges that sit at the interface between development and the environment. Her lifelong passion is Peru, where she lived undertaking her PhD part-time at the University College London. And in 2005, she became the first female professor of geography at Newcastle and remained there until 2016, after which she became a professor of geography and development at the University of St. Andrews. In 2020, she was awarded the Royal Geographical Society Busk Medal for Field-Based Research, and in 2021, made a Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. She is currently working with Peruvian colleagues on an interdisciplinary project on climate change and on Nino food systems in the northern desert, desert coastal region. And we also have Dr. Tanya Mendo with us tonight, who was supposed to be speaking, but she lost her voice. <laughs> um, but I'll introduce her anyway, she's super integral. Uh, she's a researcher based at the Scottish Oceans Institute, which is in St. Andrews, and she has worked in fisheries-related science, focusing mainly on marine invertebrates and fish for more than 10 years. Her work has focused on the integration of biology and ecology into fisheries management, and she has worked on applied science projects with the scallop, lobster, and crab fishing industries. Her latest research has focused on developing and refining methods to gather spatio-temporal information of fishing activities, catch and bycatch in small-scale fisheries operating in, north, in the North Sea and in South America. This information is used to inform local, <coughs> regional, and national fisheries management, as well as marine planning and related policy commitments. So thank you for being here. Um, one thing I'm going to add is I think after the lecture, you're able to view the exhibition downstairs. Um, it's an exciting opportunity to see that. So please welcome our researchers. <laughs> And uh, thank you so much for coming out, and thank you for the people who are online. As I was uh, saying to some folk earlier, um, this engagement with uh, the Museum of Study Students has been really rich for me. Um, it's also brought me back to the museum. I have been a couple of times as a, a tourist, and as a result, I've now become a member, and I've started giving membership um, to people as birthday presents. And I was also thrilled that um, our department, because of the exhibition, um, paid for first-year students to come uh, to see the exhibition and also visit the museum, because I just think it's, a, it's an amazing resource. And in part inspired, as you'll see uh, later on in what I'm going to say, in part ins inspired by this engagement with the museum, um, we've started to work a lot more closely with the idea of heritage and the roles of museums in uh, resilient and in uh, supporting livelihoods in the context of climate change in Peru as well. This is a, a new sort of working area for me. So, so basically I'm starting with a thank you um, to the museum and also I just want to recognise uh, Mr Todd who uh, passed away this year um, as somebody who was really important in the museum and hugely supportive of um, people engaging with the coast in, in this part of Fife and I got to know him through the coastal rowing uh, community, and he was hugely supportive of that, so um, it's an honour to be here. And very sadly, the fishing expert <laughs> is the one who's lost her voice, so when I don't do justice to maybe some of the fishing bits, um, she can put her hand up and, 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 and croak um, what we're going to talk about. So, in terms of framing this, we were thinking, well, why is this corner of Peru relevant today? Uh, and, and, and to hear and struggle at this corner of Fife. And it is really relevant because we are all facing very similar challenges at the moment in terms of what's happening to fisheries, what's happening to communities, what's happening to precarity, the fact that people don't know at the moment, also in our country, how they're going to make a living. You know, following on from COVID, but also economic inflation, etc. So, so part of the story of today is how to prepare to be more resilient as coastal communities or as communities that are engaging in, 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 in fishing. In this context, in the desert, in one of the driest deserts of the world, uh, the northern coastal desert um, of Peru. And basically, what we're talking about is a context of something that is nearly always seen as a disaster, and by engaging with how local people experience um, sudden rains and fishing opportunities, we want to challenge that idea of what can be done in a so-called disaster. And the disaster that we're talking about is the El Nino. 
Now you'll see in a minute on a diagram that the El Nino is basically cyclical rains that come usually between five and seven years, have done, done so through thousands of years, and in the northern part of Peru, um, they have a big impact because the rains for the first time come from the Pacific instead of uh, from the Amazon. The predominant rains, usually in this part of the world, come across the Amazon, they go up high across the Andes, and then as you all know from your school geography, that means there's a rain shadow on the other side. So that is why there is a desert along the coast of Peru. But in an El Nino year, which you can't always predict when it's going to be, but in an El Nino year, massive rains come very suddenly from the Pacific and they hit the coast. They also have huge implications as we see for fishing. So basically, there is a dominant narrative that have gone through history about the El Nino in Peru being a disaster. And each time they think there might be a new El Nino coming, then the newspapers get on board and they say, oh, you know, it's going to be like that one in 1983, or it's going to be like that one in 1998. And this is a, a, one of the typical sort of uh, newspaper articles um, that was um, trying to predict the fact that there was due to be a big El Nino in 2016. And it was, this article says things like, oh, it's going to be a similar magnitude to the one of 97-98 when there were uh, huge numbers of people affected um, by <coughs> flooding and, and their homes, etc., were also abandoned. Now, as I'm trying to suggest, this story of disaster uh, is, is, is not necessarily new. And um, Paddington went to the north of Peru. When we first started this research, my colleague Andy Henderson had um, two young boys, and uh, they didn't understand that Paddington actually was a fictitious character that the British know about, but uh, not, not many other people. And um, so we had to take Paddington with us everywhere that we went in Peru. And this is Paddington in the Temple of the Sun and the Moon in, in uh, northern Peru. This is an absolutely stunning archaeological ruin in, in the desert. And basically, the Moshe culture was organized around the El Nino. In order to ward off an El Nino, every several years or so, there would be human sacrifices, and then another part of the pyramid would be built. So the whole of this society was built around the idea of El Nino coming and bringing devastation, and what you have to do to appease the gods to stop that devastation. But at the same time, it was a culture that lived with El Nino, that managed the waters incredibly well in the desert, that lived between waters that brought rain to the desert for agriculture, and fisheries in the lagoons that appeared, and also fisheries in the sea. So the story I'm telling you then is a story that is, is thousands of, of years old, livelihoods that have lived with these uh, periodic rains that you're never really quite sure when they're going to appear. And even in more recent time, the sort of evocative landscape of this disaster is, is very similar. Okay, so here you've got the main plaza, the main square in the, in the main city of Pura in northern Peru. And the picture on the far left, um, which I think is upstairs in the exhibition actually, uh, from my friend and colleague Luz Maria Guerrero, that is the main plaza in 1925. And on the right is the same plaza, the same building, the yellow building is this building here, but from a different angle, um, in uh, 2017. So the predicted 2016 El Nino didn't happen. But what suddenly happened from nowhere was a 2017 El Nino. And what my scientist colleagues have, have, have found out is that the origins and the type of causes of this El Nino are slightly different. And the, the nearest one uh, to 2017 was, was 1925. And they've been able to study the types of rain, where the sea warming appeared, etc., to refine our understanding of different types of El Nino. Okay? But even if the types of El Nino seem to be different, or their, their origins are, are slightly different, the image is still one of disaster, a major impact on the city, devastation. This was the so-called new bridge that replaced the old bridge that got um, flooded out, and the new bridge, as you can see, was also flooded out. Great geography uh, picture for you. So what we can see here is the normal conditions, what I was describing about uh, the the, why the rains come, basically the seawater temperatures um, off the coast of Peru and the Pacific 
um, rise and therefore the movement of the surface water changes and therefore the direction um, of the precipitation changes. But as you can imagine, if you change those currents and you change the temperatures of the water, you're also radically, radically changing the fisheries like that. And this change in uh, fisheries is particularly important in Peru because it's the largest single fishery in the world. Okay, the uh, Anchoveta, uh, uh, I was going to say Hulkstil, Anchoveta catch here is 6 to 13 million tonnes per year. And that's 1 billion US dollars. Now, Tanya basically has put this slide together and I love what she's done here. So, you know, 1 billion US dollars is, depending on the rate of exchange at the moment, um, is, you know, quite a bit of money in pounds. But as Tanya says, it's not just about what the money means in terms of what you can buy with it with hard capital. It's also about what it says about your society. So we've got the queen on our coins. In Peru, the sol has the anchoveta. Okay, their money has a fish on. Now we've got a fish on one of our Scottish notes. We should find out which, does anybody know which one that is? The Clydesdale, there's a fish, isn't there? We were not let now, my students are doing the work. <laughs> <laughs> but so, but this, this shows the importance, the, the, the iconic importance of fisheries in Peru, the fact that it's on the money in, in, in this way. And this is the, the uh, catch that gets absolutely devastated when an El Nino comes. Now, what normally happens to that fish? So the antrobeta uh, gets turned into fish meal largely. Some of it um, finds its way to the UK. Uh, it's fed in salmon fisheries, um, in salmon farming. Also in, in chicken feed. To be honest, if you eat chicken in coastal Peru, I think it always tastes of fish because they feed them on fish meal. Okay, and, and uh, so there's many uses for, for fish meal, but it's a very, very dynamic and very significant industry in Peru. But when there's an El Nino, it disappears because the antiretta move because the water temperatures are too warm. So they, they move away so that the, the fishery dies. And, and it stays dead for how long, Tanya? A couple of years or so? Uh, no, no, it's very quick. It's very quick to move. Renew, yeah. Right, so how long more or less does it take to renew uh, once the rains go? Yeah, it would be a few months. Okay. Uh. So basically, very suddenly, you've got a lot of unemployed fishers with a lot of un uh, unused uh, tackle and, and equipment. Now, the other industry that is very significant in this area is scallops. Now, the scallop industry migrated north to northern Peru uh, with fishers from further south, from the Pisco area. And this is something that Tanya and I would love to do a bit of work on, you know, because they brought their skills in the same way that if you think about the, the migration around the scallop industry in, in Scotland, you know, who moves, why do they move, what do they take with them when, when they go to new areas, what do they lose? And this is a massive industry in northern Peru that earns a huge amount of money um, however, once the El Nino comes, the floods come down from the mountains, the rivers discharge huge amounts of sediment into the sea, and basically the, the scallop industry is, 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 is uh, unusable. So, you know, the, the, it, it can't actually uh, produce in that time. So again, you've got divers who dive for scallop, you've got people who fish who are suddenly not doing these things for a short period of time. And this is some uh, work that just talks about, um, ask people how has uh, the phenomenon that El Nino affected your income? So basically, when they compared 2015, which wasn't an El Nino year, with 2017, you can see by the dark colour, that is basically how much less they earned. So the per percentage contribution um, in this time was hugely less. So again, you know, we need to collect this information from fishers to find out what the impact has been. And, and as Tanya said, it does recover, but nevertheless, that is a big loss. It might also be a loss of markets, companies might go under, etc., as we're experiencing at the moment. So my research then, how did I come about uh, doing, doing this? I've been working in Peru for about 30 years, um, as Emily said, and I basically ended up doing this research a bit by happenstance. I was in Peru working with other colleagues, 
uh, on something completely different, and some friends of mine were going to take samples of the mud um, of the rivers and of the lakes to try to work out whether, with climate change, El Nino is becoming um, more or less um, intense and more frequent. They basically can take samples, look at the pollen particularly. So these are people called paleoecologists, okay, and they reconstruct the past environment. I went with them because none of them spoke English, uh, Spanish rather. Um, so I was basically the, the, the translator and I thought it would be a bit of fun and I said, well, at the same time, what I'll do is I'll do some scoping of the archives and I'll see how El Nino is talked about in, in the archives, okay? Newspaper archives and also see what there is in terms of colonial archives from the colonial period to see whether, you know, what, what people have said about El Nino. Well, the very funny thing is that we've got a database of more than 6,000 newspaper articles that we've classified, we've digitised, and we're making these available to the National Museum. And again, something to think about here, you know, what do we do with the information we get on fishing, the, the, the decline of fishing? Where do we make that available to the general public? Where do we make that available to school kids? So, you know, this is the sorts of things that our, our project is trying to do in Peru. But the funny thing is that the colonial archives, basically, in that area, there was a, 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 a big... A uh, repository of uh, uh, archives uh, going back hundreds of years. It got flooded in the 1983 El Nino, so lost, lost to humanity, sadly. But some of our colleagues in the University of, of Pura are working now uh, with archives that have been digitised from Lima and also some that are held in Seville in the Library of the Indies. But basically, the message was yeah, it's a disaster. Wherever we looked at these newspapers, it was. Yeah, crops die, infrastructure dies, it's a disaster. The petroleum oil duct that brings the petroleum from Amazonia and comes out in Bayova in this area got broken, etc., etc. And, you know, lots of stories about aid coming. And, and this particular one here I really like because it talks about uh, reconstruction in the area, uh, people are being paid as volunteers, uh, and they're being paid with food. So this is food for work programmes, people themselves... Um, uh, trying to rebuild um, their community. So the story was absolutely one of disasters, including for the fisheries, the sea fisheries, as I've suggested. So what changed then? What changed this piece of work? work? Well, as ever, um, a happenstance meeting. Um, my colleagues here rented a very, very nice uh, 4x4. <coughs> did let, let, let me drive every now and again. There's nothing better than a Toyota through the desert. I, I'm sorry, I know that's unsound. Uh, and I, I applaud the time when we get a 4x4 uh, electric car, Tanya, I promise you I will. However, this was, this was lots of fun. And I went with them and, and I said to them, you know, we need to go to the municipality to ask for permission to take the samples. And they said, why? Said, why? Said, well, because it's their land. Well, we did it before. I said, yeah, I said, but we really do need to get permission. So we walked up to the, um, the local uh, mayor's office in the municipality and introduced straight away. They were the scientists, they were the ingenieros, the engineers. I was sort of, I mean, I'm a professor, they're not, but I was like the little woman who was doing the secretarial work or the translation. So I was getting a little bit irritated at this point. And, um, but I, I managed to hold it together. And then the mayor said, oh, do you know what? I'll take you through the desert. And the mayor here, so this is the community of Cristo Nos Valga. Christ uh, values us, will save us. And it's a very poor part of uh, uh, Sechura and Apura. And he was the mayor of this area. His name there, Angel Agorto Pingo. And you, this, this picture off to the right underneath the, um, uh, the, the, the 4 by 4 basically talks about this being an area that suffers from uh, anemia and malnutrition. Okay, so it's, it's a desert community, so it's, it's a poor community. And what he said, um, Angel Pingo, is I'll come with you through the desert and I'll introduce you to some of the communities. Now also, obviously for him, as the mayor, it's quite good to be seen with, with people, seem to be doing something. And it may put up my within a two hours to a lot quicker. So we're going through the desert and I sort of was sitting in the back with him and making conversation. And um, I said, well, you know, yeah, it's really awful, isn't it, what El Nino does here? It's really awful. You know, I've been reading it in the newspapers about the devastation and all of this. And he said to me, 
de señorita. Para nosotros no es ningún desastre, es abundancia. Miss, for us, it's not anything to do with disaster, it's about abundance. And I thought, whoa, this is the story. This is a very different story than the story that we hear in the newspapers or that we hear in academic articles. So that's where we started doing a bit more investigation. And this is the setting of the investigation. This is the desert from uh, Sentinel-2 satellite imagery. So you've got January 2017, so before the El Nino Costero that I've mentioned, completely dry. And then uh, two months later, you can see that lake appearing at the bottom, Laguna La Nina, it's called. And then two years later, it's still there. Now, this is really important. These are the lagoons that appear in the middle of the desert at the time of El Nino that last for several years and provide not only stop gaps for the fishery community in those months when they can't go to sea, but also longer term. People who might not be professional fishers become, in the sea, become artisanal fishers. People fish and they prepare and they also grow crops in ways that they did before. And um, these events...
opportunities that have been taken advantage of that maybe people don't, don't know about. And in the description here that I, I'm not going to read, um, you can actually see the sort of, this is more than informal, this is local people organising, these are people who otherwise would take the refrigerated trucks from the sea, they then take them to the lagoons, they park them up for a few days, uh, the fish is fish, and they uh, leave it, they, they basically take big blocks of ice, they put them in, in the, the containers that you'll see in a minute, and then they take them off to market. So you can imagine the level of organisation that it takes to happen have that happen from one day to the next. So we found, for example, uh, Once de Oro, uh, the community of uh, professional fishers from the sea, they organised themselves as a community and went. And there was another com community that had been dislocated from the coast during one of the El Niños, and they also move as a community, and they're the ones who do the contracts um, with the, the, the lorry drivers. But here I just want to draw your attention to the technology of the rafts. So on the picture closest to us, so these rafts are from you know, pre-Columbian time, thousands of years old designs these are. Um, but what happens, and, and they're also used very close to the shore as well, along with further south, the iconic reed boats, of which there's uh, one, a model of one upstairs in the exhibition. But here, you can see they've been slightly modified. So here, the fishers have replaced some of that heavy wooden holds with uh, plastic guttering. This is, this is tubes, plastic sewage, sewage and guttering uh, gut down pipes. And they like those because they're lighter. Uh, so you, you, and you, you know, some of the, the lorry can only stay so far, so then you've got to carry them to the edge of the lake. They're lighter, but in the sea, they, they break more easily. So again, really interesting, these minuscule changes um, in uh, some of the, the, the technologies uh, that people are using. But otherwise, they said it's the same nets, it's the same hooks, etc. And the thing that I was trying to suggest that is very important in this context is there's a diversity of fishers and of fishing communities. Some are professional uh, divers for scallops, some go further out in, in, on the bigger boats in, 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 in further distances, and there's a real issue with some of the uh, Chinese big offshore ships coming and hoovering up. Um, but there's this also other sector who are artisanal fishers and also farmers. And this points to the relationship between when there's a year of abundance, what do they do? They buy fishing equipment. When they do well from the fishing equipment, they might consolidate their house, they might use that to get loan for fertilisers, etc. So what this quote here is saying is it's mutual, so there's always something. Sometimes when there's a good harvest from the farm, that's when I buy tools to go fishing. And also when there's good fishing and we want things for the farm. These are the practices that are thousands of years old. The archaeological site that we're working with in Chusis shows a very similar relationship between sea fishing, lagoon fishing and agriculture. And interestingly, the uh, mummies that they found are 1 metre 74 very, very, very tall people, much taller than, uh, than today. So, you know, colonialism and that rupture within this, this, this managing of the local resources had a fundamental impact on, um, on, on, on uh, people's health. I draw you back to that picture about anemia. You know, why is there anemia somewhere when three out of every 10 years there's abundance? So something needs to, 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 to be done here. And in terms of the marketing, um, you can see these are the boxes they put them in. And uh, so this was just one man who was trying to get to recreate, because there's no official data on this, to try to recreate how much people produce was really difficult. So we had to do it uh, with our, our colleagues at Ivan and Evelyn through narratives, through interviews. <coughs> so people would say, well, there are about four to 500 boxes, each of 20 kilos each. That's about 9,000. And then we get that in three days. And there might be, you know, six or seven of these. So using that, we try to estimate the value of the catch. And what is really interesting for us is, you know, these are mullet, and you know, there's certain prejudice about mullet being bottom feeders. Um, and yet there's a massive market for mullet in Peru. Um, <coughs> interestingly, a lot of this was taken two days down to Lima, where it sold really well. So, Sea, sea mullet also goes to Lima, and 
Chiclayo. Now, Chiclayo is the nearest <coughs> town. It also produces a lot of um, there's a lot of fishing in Chiclayo as well. <coughs> and what for me was really interesting is that the local market in Pura, they wouldn't touch the miso <coughs> called in Spanish, the mullet that came from the lagoons, because they said, oh no, that mullet is you know it's polluted, it's contaminated because it's been from the lagoons. It's got a slightly different taste because they're feeding on on the, the, the semi-fresh water brackish. <coughs> Yeah. 
get credit. Neither of those fish is going to be able to get credit because the banks are going to say that a disaster is coming. So because of this overall disaster narrative about how El Nino impacts, that doesn't take into account that actually there's a certain group of farmers and fishers with a bit of credit at that point could really rock and roll and take off, okay? That just shows that we need more flexible mechanisms <coughs> on um, COVID. Hey, this should be sounding really familiar to us in, in the post-COVID context uh, in the UK. And also identify missed opportunities for aquaculture. So obviously, you know, the, the lagoons last for, for, for three years. But if they've been successful for three years, what would be the opportunities for aquaculture in, in this area? And I know there's quite a lot of interest in tilapia, but as I've said, you know, tilapia uh, and the municipal um, government of Satura have got some ponds where nurseries with tilapia that they're then looking into. But tilapia are also con um, carnivores. So, you know, what other opportunities for aquaculture uh, are there? Lesson two. We need to take advantage of the long history that I've suggested um, of El, uh, El Nino and its management. And this is the heart of the exhibition upstairs, um, which we are so very proud of. Because at the heart of the exhibition uh, are the stories from the area that have been generated um, by children of the area. And again, you know, it's come about because of something that wasn't expected. Originally, as part of our research design, myself and my team and my Peruvian colleagues and their team, we were going to go and interview people ourselves. And we were going to work with the local school that we were going to do intergenerational oral histories, like tell me about your granddad sort of stuff. Due to go, lockdown happened. We all stayed here. We couldn't go anywhere. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, what on earth are we going to do with this project? And um, Bisma, our NGO colleague, working with the school said, you know what? Let's develop a digital curricula. Let's teach these kids online to be able to um, do oral histories. Now, at the same time, the Peruvian government was in trying to introduce an online curricula. Now, we know how difficult that was here. Imagine what that is like in a country that's a lot poorer, where digital connection is really poor, and you happen to live in a desert. Right? and you, you don't have access to anything. So what we did was, instead of using the money for travel, is we bought um, tablets, computer tablets, small tablets. Now, sounds really easy, right? But up there on the left is Oliver, who the team know with uh, the school teacher. The amount of effort under complete lockdown to get the tablets and to get them to secure and to give them out to the school kids when the school was shut for two years was massive. Okay, but... But, and then we paid for the, as part of the, the project, paid for their um, computer data time, you know, the, 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 phone, the phone time. And then even working out which service provider you could access in the desert. It's not the same one for the whole area. So all of this was a huge amount of work. And Oliver particularly really um, uh, did great stuff. And these videos that the kids made talking about how they managed the El Nino phenomenon during um, uh, lockdown that they made them are oh, what's on the screen upstairs at the heart of the exhibition. And what I love is when you come through the door, okay, you see the title, and this is where, you know, you guys have done such an amazing job. You see the title of the exhibition, you know, When It Rains We Harvest, and then straight away you're taken to the TV in the corner with the children telling the story of how the El Nino brings abundance. And we all have favourite ones, and I'm just going to play you a little bit of this. We put all of them with subtitles, and um, I'll just play you. Hola, muy buenos días con todos. Mi nombre es Alexa Sánchez Tumen, alumna de la Institución Educativa de Daniel Arcilla Escaño. Y hoy les hablaré sobre la arquitectura de la serie de Maravilla y del elemento principal que yo considero importante. Cultura ha sido la actividad económica tradicional del caserío de Manavida, donde se cultivó de forma intensa productos como son el maíz, el zapallo, el algodón, el camote, etc. Ok. There are a lot more that you can see upstairs and with similar enthusiasm, particularly around the fishing and the combination of the two. But what I want to, to finish with is what this then ended up becoming 
which was something we hadn't envisaged at all. And this was because of the collaboration with um, my colleague Karen Brown, who, who works with the Museum Study Students and works with Linda, is that the discussion went after lockdown stopped. Why not use this material that the school children have produced uh, and think about a community museum? Up to that point, what we were using it for was material for a teaching curricula. So we, we're, we're developing with the Royal Geographical Society an online curricula for school teachers on uh, El Nino. And I've been talking to Cathy about the fact that my Peruvian colleagues are coming in September and we're going to be meeting with Scottish teachers through the Scottish Royal Geographical Society to try to align it with the Scottish schools curricula and the curricula for sustainable development. So, so that is what we've been thinking, okay? And it's great, it's a really, really important thing and the, the kids' videos and materials will be at the heart of it. But at the end of the day, that is still us saying, right? what needs to be produced. Whereas what emerged was the idea of a community El Nino Museum being hosted at, in the school and curated by the school children. This is why I'm wearing this, this t-shirt, yellow is not my colour. Um, but the kids wanted a t-shirt, this is the, the school colour, and it says a phenomenon of opportunity. And for the inauguration of their museum, they wanted their t-shirts. and. They also, in the t-shirts, reproduced a lot of the imagery of activities that their parents had been doing. So they weren't themselves fishers, but they, they, you'll see in a minute, they dressed up as fishers on a raft and fished, and that is what is going into the exhibition. So it's this information transference across generations that then they are curating and displaying. And I'm going to show you this because this makes me cry, and it's, Tanya hopefully can still hear it. This is how you open a museum, Peruvian style, okay? Te invita a la librería de tu coro Marcela, directora de Pichula, John Abel. Socorro Gárate, Alejandro Tumbe, a todas las autoridades para la revelación de esta sala. A la una, atentos cámaras, chicos, a las dos y a las tres. Okay, don't we look boring by comparison? <laughs> and, and this is just to give you a flavour of the inside um, of the museum space. It's it's slightly smaller than this room, okay? But the inspiration for the murals, the, the children didn't um, paint the murals but they had an input into the design of, of, of what went on, okay? And um, you can see, then, I absolutely, uh, Tanya and I love this picture, as, as does Mary Carmen, my colleague in, in, in Peru, of this young girl dressed in the T-shirt, reproducing how you fish with the net, which is what she learned through doing the oral history with her family. And, um, uh, on the left at the top there, uh, that is the head of the school board, um, uh, um, uh, Dr. Uh, and um, she is basically congratulating them. And on the back of this, there's training for all of the teachers in the school board. So there's, there's, there are many, many schools in Satura and all the teachers are having this experience shared with them to think about how they can um, structure their curricula to work with the local opportunities that there are. Because the curricula in Peru isn't about substantive materials, it's, it's on skills that you learn. Very similar, a bit more similar to the Scottish curricula, but certainly similar to the curricula on sustainable development. So the third and final lesson then from what we can learn from this small corner of Peru is to recognise and celebrate best practice. And that's why I want to, to be here in this museum, because I want to recognise and celebrate the best practice that happens here by bringing the community in. And the, the things that the students did um, with cakes with kids, they, 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 they did like fairy cakes in different colours, and then they got the kids to put uh, something in, pull it out and show all the different colours of the cake, much like my physical geography colleagues would take a sample of mud take it out and reconstruct the environment by it, from it. There's all these sorts of innovative things that make this uh, 
museum, the sort of place that's owned by the community. What I was saying about the coastal rowing, for example, I love the fact that that is in this museum. I love the fact that people come and they look at a boat and they say, yeah, I used to help build that, or what happens with the reaper, etc. So I think it's really important to recognise and celebrate best practice. And in Peru, this is what's happened. The day before the community museum opened, or a couple of days before, we found out that for the second year running, uh, this is one of the teachers, Nancy, won a national innovation and education prize. Now, this is huge. This is huge for a very small community in a marginalised desert area of Peru, that they got national recognition for what they had done, and they've now had it two years running. And I was just sort of saying, you know, wouldn't it be brilliant if we had a, a, a prize in Fife for um, educational innovation around sustainable fisheries? You know, it's, it's, it's this sort of thing about how to celebrate, recognise and celebrate best practice. So these are things that we wanted to share with you. I am so sorry you didn't hear from our fisheries expert, but I will, uh, she's able to answer, croaky answer out any questions. So, but thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here, and for those of you online. Thank you.